Welcome back to History Class with Dr. W. We're continuing our discussion of the presidents and politics of the 1920s. In the previous lectures, we talked about Warren G. Harding, who was president in the early 20s. And now we're going to pick up the story of the next president, Calvin Coolidge, who took over after Harding's death. In many ways, Coolidge was a welcome change from Harding's presidency. He certainly wasn't as popular or outgoing or charismatic, but he was more thoughtful and organized and more demanding of his appointees. He struggled a bit to get out from the shadow of Harding's administration. Somewhat reluctantly, he retained most of Harding's cabinet, and in the first years of his administration, many of Harding's scandals were coming to light. He gradually outgrew his own connections to Harding and ultimately had a successful presidency during the prosperous period from 1923 to 1929. Born in Vermont in 1872, he was named John Calvin Coolidge after his father, who maintained modest prosperity as a teacher, storekeeper, farmer, and half a dozen other jobs. His mother died when he was 12. Coolidge led a simple, idealistic childhood. In rugged Vermont, he learned attributes such as caution, fairness, frugality, honesty, and unpretentiousness. He was the first in his family to attend college, graduating from Amherst in 1895. He trained in the law and passed the bar two years later. In the late 1890s, he became active in the Massachusetts Republican Party, and politics became his second career. In 1905, he married Grace Coolidge, a vivacious, good-humored woman of varied interest and a teacher at the Institute for the Deaf. In 1909, he was elected mayor of Northampton, Massachusetts, and in 1911, elected to the state senate. In 1915, then, he was elected lieutenant governor of Massachusetts. Throughout this early career, Coolidge compiled a relatively progressive, if frugal, record. He spoke much of helping the people, and believed it, as long as the price tag wasn't too high. He identified reasonably well with the common people, and got along well with just about everybody. With this record, he ran successfully for governor in 1918, during which time he advocated the 19th Amendment for women's suffrage, rights for laborers, and reorganization of the state government. But he would be most identified with the Boston police strike in September 1919, after which he supported the firing of the police and uttered his famous words that, quote, there is no right to strike against the public safety by anybody, anywhere, anytime. He was seen as a champion of order in a time of chaos. In the early going, he was a candidate for the presidency in 1920, but after the nomination of Warren Harding, he was chosen for the vice president on the ticket. As mentioned, the pair won a resounding victory over Cox and FDR. As vice president, he really didn't distinguish himself, playing no significant role in the Harding administration. He almost faded from notice until Harding died on October, August 2, 1923, and Coolidge then ascended to the presidency. Both the president and the first lady were a marked contrast with the previous administration. Harding had been extroverted and a bit wild, living at the fringes of morality. Coolidge was quiet and thoughtful, easily fatigued, relatively simple, and a bit secretive. He was a private person, for this quality, he came to be nicknamed Silent Cal. It was said that a woman approached him at one point and told him, I made a bet today that I could get more than two words out of you. To which he replied, You lose. Also contrasting with Florence Harding was Grace Coolidge, who was a charming, enthusiastic, and popular first lady. Also adding to the household were their two sons, John and Calvin. Young Calvin's death in July 1924 from a foot infection stunned the nation. Coolidge was very different as an administrator than Harding. 
He expected much more from his appointees and kept closer watch on them. For the most part, he received quality service from the executive branch. It took Coolidge a few years to grow into the presidency in his own right. He was hampered in the early years because he inherited Harding's cabinet, which he didn't know well and which varied considerably in quality. He also felt compelled to carry out Harding's wishes after ascending to the presidency and not dismiss his cabinet members too quickly. These problems afflicted him as the Harding scandals came to light, but Coolidge acquitted himself reasonably well in addressing them. During the investigations into Attorney General Doherty, he allowed Doherty to continue to serve until he refused to step down as Attorney General even for his own trial. At last, he demanded that Doherty resign. There was a movement among some Democrats and even a few Republicans to implicate Coolidge in the Harding scandals. Coolidge kept a clear head in spite of numerous insults and attacks. He appointed two special investigators to examine the scandals and ultimately allowed all the investigations to clear him of any wrongdoing. He didn't get down in the mud with his detractors at that time, which served him well in the 1924 presidential campaign. Coolidge's campaign slogan in 1924 was Keep Cool with Coolidge, a reference in no small part to Teapot Dome and Coolidge's handling of the many scandals. He didn't face many competitors for the Republican nomination, and he was easily nominated at the Republican National Convention in June. His vice president was a banker from Illinois, Charles G. Dawes, who had recently returned from helping to revive the failing economies of Europe. The Democrats should probably have been able to capitalize on the failures of the Harding administration, particularly the Teapot Dome, but there were fierce divisions within the Democratic Party. A number of Democrats were tainted by the oil scandals as well. Prohibition was a divisive issue, and the KKK was at its height. It took 103 ballots for the Democrats to settle on a candidate during which process all the major candidates exposed each other's flaws and tore down their chances. The nominee was a relatively obscure Wall Street lawyer from Virginia named John W. Davis. Better known was another Republican running as a third-party candidate, Senator Robert La Follette from Wisconsin. Coolidge ran a, on a campaign of economic prosperity and deflected any criticisms leveled by Davis. La Follette took votes from both candidates, but it's not thought that he determined the outcome as a third-party candidate. Coolidge won easily, with nearly 16 million votes to Davis' 8 million and La Follette's 5 million. So even adding up all of Davis and La Follette, Coolidge would still have won by a considerable margin. With a full term secure, Coolidge set out to establish a record of his own. He strove for efficiency and frugality in government. He hoped to lessen the federal deficit, balance the budget, and cut taxes all at the same time. One of his mottos was that the chief business of the American people is business, and he acted on that motto. Other issues of concern in this era were lynching. He supported an anti-lynching law, as had Harding. Immigration restriction, which he also supported, and the League of Nations, to which he was opposed. In our next lecture, we'll talk in more detail about each of these various policies and Coolidge's record as president.